Office. Welcome back to coverage here at Grand Prix Memphis. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. I'm in the booth with Reed Duke. Thank you so much for joining us here for round number five. We've got Standard Ari Lax versus Brian Brown Doing. And, uh, well, it looks like we've got blue black mid range, maybe control, however you want to call it, for BBD. On the other side of the table, Ari is playing something we are calling Naya Monsters. Looks like he went big. Yeah. So I noticed he took a mulligan. By his body language, I think he scried a land to the top because his hand looks a little bit land light, but he's developing nicely with a turn two servant of the conduit. Man, three times so far we've seen this start from the blue black uh, blue black players of, of Ether Hub into Glint Sleeve Siphoner. Looks strong every time they do it. I can see why these players are, are running the Siphoner. Good early game threats, going to pile in a bit of damage and even generate card advantage this early. And wow, look at that, another hub read basically saying to Ari Lax, you better have an answer for this Siphoner or it is going to be completely out of control. And Fatal Push as well means that uh, Servant of the Conduit doesn't get to do its thing. Let's see if Ari has an answer for the Siphoner. Ooh, and I see Ari no. punished a little bit by the three-color mana base. He has a Jade Light Ranger, which would have been the perfect play for this turn, but he can't cast it because only one green mana. And once again, BBD is going to cash in two energy and a life to draw an additional card. And this Siphoner is just going, I got this, BBD. I'm going the distance on my own. Let's see what the three drop is here for Brian. Champion of Wits. Perhaps digging for a land? Champion of Wits are... Uh, Interesting role player card in these blue-black mid-range decks. Note that it doesn't put you up on uh, card advantage. It, you draw two, you discard two, and all you get out of it is a 2-1 body. But the really nice thing is that it it's just sort of a built-in late-game card advantage engine for the deck as those cards will eventually wind up in the graveyard. And anytime you look down and have seven mana, you can really get the ball rolling again, restock your hand. Big card logic. here from Ari Lax and a relative newcomer to standard, Rekindling Phoenix. Reed, are you impressed by this card? Is it a flash in the pan? What are we looking at here? Super impressed by this card. Uh, a four power flyer for what I would consider a relatively affordable mana cost. Mm -hmm. This is just something that really punishes players that are unprepared. And it's easy to be unprepared for this card because of the resilient uh, ability to come back from the graveyard. You really have to be prepared with specifically an exile removal spell. Not a normal blocker, not a normal removal spell. Exile removal spell or else this flying creature is going to kill you. No questions asked. Yeah, otherwise it puts you in the awkward position of needing two removal spells. One to kill a medium to large size threat and then basically one to kill any creature in standard. And this is a nice play from Brian Brown doing. So he attacks with both Ari blocks, the Phoenix takes two damage, <laughs> aggro from Ari Lax, but anybody who's watched him play knows that he kind of plays like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, then Brian used a walking ballista on two counters, one of them to finish off the Phoenix, and another one to kill the little elemental token to make sure it didn't come back. Yeah, walking ballista is um, has an interesting relationship with the rekindling Phoenix. It's one part of a package for being able to handle that card as you can either, I mean, make it very large, the Walking Ballista, or pair it with a removal spell and use the Ballista counter to take out the 0-1 token, as you mentioned. Uh, and it's particularly helpful because you can front load your mana by putting the Walking Ballista into play early if you need to, and then uh, tap out for a removal spell on the Phoenix and, and still be ready to deal with that 0-1 elemental. I see, yeah, that's a really smart way to be able to handle it. In the meantime, Chandra Torch of Defiance came down, finally took out that Siphoner, although it had already done its job and now is going to tick upwards, knocking BBD down to 16. But uh, he is going to need to find a blocker or a way to interact with the uh, gifted Aetherborn. And it's Jade Light Ranger, another relative newcomer to standard. Yeah, Jade Light Ranger is the probably the best example of a constructed card that uses the Explore mechanic. Um, we've seen, you know, fringe use of stuff like Merfolk Branch Walker, but Jade Light Ranger, really the, uh, the power level is pushed to a level where it's it's strong and constructed. Two Explorers means you can either get quite a lot of direct card advantage off the Jade Light Ranger. I mean, there's no better feeling than when your hand's a little bit land light. You get to find yourself two lands off the top um, yep. for, for the low cost of three mana. But even in 
if you can even call it the, the bad case scenario, you wind up with a 4-3 creature that happens to pair really well with Winding Constrictor, which we've seen in some other shells. Maybe we can have Ari move his library and graveyard over a little bit for us. Just because it was hard to see, he was actually contemplating some cards on the top with the Ranger's first explorability, but it's hard to see them. So if Brian could take care of the Jade Light Ranger here, it's... Oh, perfect. So he gets to, to get rid of the Jade Light Ranger with Ravenous Chupacabra, an onboard two-for-one, and then attack and kill the Chandra. So a huge swing in favor of Brian Braun doing here. Yeah, that was a nice play from BBD. Any removal spell got the job done, but a Chupacabra is an especially good one. A Mountain, and is that some kind of Planeswalker, and a Johnny, a Johnny Unyielding, perhaps? Left on top of Ari Lax's library. Yeah, I just can't quite see it, but it does look like it might be in a Johnny. If we could just have him move it over, that would be good. It looks like Ari's just going to bite the bullet here and trade off Jade Light Ranger for the uh, gifted Aetherborn. And I can confirm, Ari Lax does have two copies of a Johnny Unyielding in his deck. That is a blast from the past, or potentially a card that, that never quite, you know, I was, was a blast say, from the past. Is, is that even a thing? Like, what is happening here? Now, this was kind of interesting. BBD actually used Field of Ruin here, probably thinking, well, you're not going to shuffle away your Planeswalker, right? Interestingly enough, Marshall, Field of Ruin is it's worded a in a way shuffle? where it's, it's mandatory to shuffle yeah. your library. Yeah, so Lax says, well, I'm going to take the forest for free then. Other similar cards like uh, Path to Exile, you can say, no, thank you. I'm just going to leave the top of my library the way I stacked it. Field of Ruin, no option. You have to shuffle. So really powerful there. I, you know, it didn't really do much to hinder Ari Lax's mana development as he had already had all of his colors and plenty of mana, but... Shuffling away a potentially really powerful top deck and, frankly, robbing us of the chance to see a Johnny Unyielding on the battlefield. That's right. <laughs> Come on, BBD. Right, so it would have to be a May ability. Right. And it's just not. <clears throat> that was Essence Scatter hitting another copy of Jade Light Ranger. Right now... BBD down to just a Ravenous Chupacabra, but this is a big play from Ari Lax. He's got another Chandra Torch of Defiance. He uses it to kill the Chupacabra, but he has a good chance to untap with Chandra, and that's exactly where you want to be, and he's going to get to do that as it's just BBD bringing back the Champion of Wits. Yeah, so here we see the real power of Champion of Wits, the... Uh actual cast of the card on turn three was sort of just an appetizer. That's not the real reason that Brian has it in his deck. It's more for this eternalized late game value. And from a position where Brian was suffering from mana for a little bit, he's now back in the game. Hello, plus Chandra hit Glorybringer. <coughs> that had to be one of his best possible hits, right? Absolutely. He's going to use the exert ability to kill that token. And now he's got, once again, Chandra in a protected position where he's very likely to get to untap with Chandra again, and this starts to snowball. But Brian has picked up four fresh cards, so he might um, have something like a Walking Ballista or a Vraska's Contempt to take care of this Chandra immediately. If you're a Brian Braun Duin fan, you're definitely going to hope that he, he has something to make sure Ari can't untap with both of these giant threats. Yeah, and Chandra Torch of Defiance. That card didn't go anywhere, and it has just been a powerhouse in standard since it's been in. Amazing card. Really De sick. Definitely climbing the, the rankings of all-time Planeswalkers. We're used to it now, right? Like, it's not, you know, we've seen so much Chandra Torch of Defiance that we don't see it on the battlefield and go, oh, my God, look at that. But that card is nasty. Are we going to see a Gear Hulk here? No. Walking Ballista, Ping Ping. I still get to keep a plus one, plus one counter as well. So, I got to say, Rebd doing really good work with Walking Ballista this game. 
using it in conjunction with the block to take down a rekindling phoenix. And now, even though he doesn't really have haste creatures available or anything like that, he uses it to kill Chandra before Ari gets on tap with it for, the, for a second turn. All right, a second copy of Glorybringer. This is going to exert and most likely kill the Glint Sleeve Siphoner. Yeah, here we go. And uh, he, we, we focus on the change in the battlefield with these Glorybringers killing creatures, but let's not forget that they're also taking away big chunks of Brian Brondoon's life every time they connect. It is funny, because you, you do tend to think of that as like a removal spell. Right, where you're like, okay, i got to kill this so they can't kill my creatures. But look at BBD's life total. He's at 12. <laughs> Could easily be dead in two turns. I am really impressed by how Ari has been able to fight back. I mean, hitting that glory bringer off the Chandra was obviously a huge swing in his direction. But he has had a lot of key threats killed, and he's still going at it. Yeah, Marshall, let's talk about Ari's deck here. Mm -hmm. the, the archetype that we, we are using the term monsters to describe this. Mm -hmm. It's a really good term for this type of deck because the real strength of what Ari's playing here, and we've seen similar decks in the past, usually in the red and green colors, is that it's full of threats that can win the game on their own when they go unanswered. Mm. Now, it's not exactly a card advantage deck. It's not exactly an aggro rushdown deck. But the strength of it is that you don't need card advantage when all of your single cards just win the game, no questions asked, if the opponent's left without a removal spell. So he's just all about presenting unbeatable threats and forcing his opponent at every juncture to have an answer for them. And thus far, BBDI has actually done a pretty good job of answering most of the threats. But when the dust is settled, there's two glory bringers, and they're lethal here. Yeah, all it takes is one to slip through the cracks, and in this case, it's two. Wow. And that's going to be game to, game one to Ari Lax. Did not think he was going to win that game in the middle part of it. I'm not going to lie. That's right. But, boy, he was able to draw some Chandras, get some Glory Bringers going, and find the victory. And look at that. He's stoked. Brian had everything go right in that game, or almost everything go right in that game. He, he, had, he hit his land drops. He had a nice curve involving creatures and removal. He drew... Uh, four cards to refill his hand with the uh, Champion of Wits later in the game, but he was just a couple removal spells short of actually answering those creatures and the giant flyers of the color red in this format. They get the job done quickly. This really is a great standard format to be playing a monsters strategy simply because the monsters are so powerful. You talked about rekindling Phoenix a moment ago. Mm -hmm. Glorybringer has been around for over a year now. We know how good that card is. Um, Chandra, amazing, perfect fit for uh, a deck that wants to sort of play this mid-range game, kill off a key threat early, and then take over with, with larger threats. Uh, it even seems that Ari's deck can make good use of the the plus two red mana ability. A Johnny Unyielding. What does he have? Two of them? Two A Johnny Unyielding. Yeah, that's another Got just it. super awesome top end card to uh, both control the battlefield and punish an opponent who, who maybe has run out of removal spells or doesn't have the right removal at the right time. I had seen uh, before today red-green monsters decks in standard. So those are, are just predictably, you know, what, what you'd expect. Rekindling Phoenix, Glorybringer at the top, little green creatures like Merfolk Branchwalker uh, to smooth things out in the early game. But what I, I really like that Ari has added the color white in order to get access to removal spells that exile cards. A big weakness of red and green as a two-color combination is an inability to deal with Hazaret and the Scarab God, and Ari's corrected that with a couple copies each of Thopter, Arrest, and Cast Out just to round things out. Re, can you explain? I, I saw a couple people in chat wondering what uh, that sheet of paper that Ari was taking a look at in between games was. Well, it could be anything. Players are allowed to bring notes to Magic tournaments, and the rule is you can have outside notes to reference in between games, just not in the middle of, of gameplay. So a lot of times what people will do is they'll either make their own notes or they'll talk to their friends, copy something from an article, potentially sideboarding guides. What am I going to do? What's my plan against each of the popular archetypes that I expect? And instead of just having to carry and juggle all that information in your own head, you get to use notes. What if, what if it's just inspirational quotes? Oh, it could definitely be inspirational quotes, yeah. What if it's just like, you're the best, 
around and is and he's he's just like getting pumped up over there yeah <laughs> for me it would probably be like something that my mom said to me like there you go Reed, you're you're my hero even when you're not doing well in the tournament yes, something like that exactly yeah. you're a beautiful unique snowflake mm-hmm. <laughs> i could say that on ra's sheet it could also say blue black minus two a johnny <laughs> plus two whatever but Maybe he just sideboards so much faster than his opponents that he needs some reading material, like newspaper, <laughs> comic book. <laughs> Those are short stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so oh, Bri- chat's getting brutal now. They say it says, "Don't forget an umbrella." <laughs> 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 we did not have our sideboard notes when we left the, the hotel room this morning. But uh, Nope. It wasn't raining when we left either. It we wasn't. just had to wait for our stupid bagels, and uh, yep. we were done for by the time we got out of there. Yep. The good news is our, our crack team here from CFB Events went to our hotel room for us, grabbed our other change of clothes. Now we're presentable. And uh, behind the coverage area, we have what looks like just a laundry room worth of stuff hanging up, hopefully to dry out for tomorrow. Are you taking a mulligan again? I would say his archetype mulligans relatively well just because of that dynamic of of sometimes a single threat being able to win on its own. the flip side of that is, is he needs his land drops, but something like a Jade Light Ranger just does such a great job smoothing out the draw and making sure he has everything he needs. So now we're in round five of this tournament. In each round so far, we've seen one of these blue-black mid-range decks. First it was Todd Anderson. Mm-hmm. Next it was Brad Nelson. Next it's Brian Braun doing... Um, I don't know for sure that these players work together, though traditionally, you know, it, it's very possible that they would. They're all coming from, from Roanoke, Virginia, and they're all friends. We haven't seen this deck win yet. <laughs> it, it's, it's a good deck in the sense that it plays a lot of the good cards in Standard and tops out at one of Standard's, you know, potentially arguably best cards, the Scarab God. Mm-hmm. But it is sort of a deck that everyone's prepared to beat. No one's really caught off guard by the Scarab God anymore. Um, and these players aren't really getting easy wins. So while I, I have a lot of faith in the three players we mentioned, Todd, Brad, and Brian, these are three of the strongest players in the room, playing a deck that gives them a lot of play, leads them to close, interesting games. I wouldn't be surprised to see them do well, but so far this deck has not been one of the most impressive in the feature match area. No, it hasn't. I, I really thought that BBD was going to win that last game. He's got Merfolk Branchwalker for Ari Lax now. It is facing down a walking ballista, and it does put BBD to a choice here, Reed, because there's a trigger on the stack that says explore. But if Brian lets it resolve and there's a non-land card on top of Ari's library, it will just get the plus one, plus one counter, and BBD will not have a chance to kill it with the ballista. He doesn't get to wait and find out. So he decides, I'm just going to go ahead and kill it now. And then he's going to follow up with a siphoner, kind of explaining that play. Yeah, it's an excellent point, and that's a subtlety about standard and the explorer mechanic in general that somebody playing for the first time might not realize. You know, one of the things that I would consider a weakness of this blue-black mid-range deck is it, it's <coughs> the, the Chandras and the Glorybringers of the red deck just wow. punish it badly. So bad. No haste creatures, no burn spells to deal damage directly to the players. So, uh, I mean, Chandra's just getting full value here. Yeah, it, it, it's just a uh, walking blister or bust, right, as far as a situation like that one. But once again, this is a rewind back to the first game. Ari Lax deals with the board. Gets BBD down to one card, one creature, plays Chandra, kills it, and now BBD is going to have to just suck it up here and go for the uh, Frasca's Contempt. Yeah. And to the, to the credit of the Rono crew, Walking Ballista is not a uh, not an obvious card to put in this deck. I mean, there's no Winding Constrictor to pair it with. Agree. But they, they seem to have chosen it potentially for that reason, just for, for those little one points of ping against the player, finish off a Chandra, whatever it might be. Um, they're, they're recognizing the value of that. Man. 
Ravenous Chalupacabra comes down and kills that Jade Light Ranger. And there's Glorybringer, but it's going to be met with Essence Scatter. And that means that uh, BBD gets to keep his Chupacabra and <laughs> doesn't have to face down a Glorybringer. I put those in order of importance, by the way, Reed. So we see <coughs> Glimmer of Genius here. We actually brushed over a pretty interesting play from a turn or two ago on five mana. Brian passed the turn and allowed Ari to untap with Chandra, which we talked about how powerful that is, yep. only to end of turn Vraska's Contempt it. It seems that he, uh, you know, when paired with the Essence Scatter in his hand, was really prioritizing not letting Glorybringer get a clean hit, as uh, we see it now does since Ari had two. But, yeah. uh, but Brian went pretty far out of his way to uh, hold up open mana for either the, the Essence Scatter or the Vraska's Contempt to deal with the first Glorybringer. He went really far because that was a Jade Light Ranger that Ari ended up hitting off of the Chandra. I mean, a disaster for BBD. Right. Ooh, here's a cool card. Dire Fleet Daredevil. Oh, yeah. This is effectively a Snapcaster Mage for the opponent's graveyard. You get to steal one of their instants or sorceries, cast it for any color of mana, and just great in a, in a drawn-out game like this against something like Blue-Black Midrange where you know they're going to have a wide variety of pretty helpful instances of sorceries to choose from. Yeah, the big difference, of course, with the Daredevil versus Snapcaster is it trades Flash for First Strike, making it a better blocker, maybe even a better attacker, but much less flexible about when you get to get your value. But you'll take it. I mean, anything vaguely similar to... <laughs> Snapcaster Mage is something that most people are going to be interested in. And it looks like, what did he flash back there? Was it a... It was a chart, chart, of course. course. Okay. And now we're going to see Jade Light Ranger once again with the trigger on the stack. Oh, and there's a Chandra. So he'll likely just dump a couple of counters on his Jade Light Ranger and pass. Boy, I'll tell you what, Reed. Ari Lax's deck is really good at presenting really nasty threats over and over and over. It's not like BBD hasn't got him, right? I mean, we saw Chupacabra get him a two-for-one. In this game, he used Walking Ballista to kill a creature. He's also had Vraska's Contempt and Essence Scatter. I mean, the BBD has thrown a lot at the creatures of Ari Lax, but Ari just seems to never run out of threats. Yeah, I'm really impressed with Ari's deck here. The number one reason that I like it is just that it plays a really high concentration of standards best cards. We've talked about these top-end red cards. Yep. Um, but... The number two reason is that Merfolk Branchwalker and Jade Light Ranger seem to do such a fantastic job of smoothing things out and making sure he has all the resources that he needs. Um, this is a deck that's really dependent on drawing the right number of lands because if you don't get to four on time, you can't cast your best cards. And if you draw eight or nine lands, you have no real way to mitigate mana flood. But Jade Light Ranger and Merfolk Branch Walker are just perfect. They represent early plays, they help you find your lands, and they help you find your action <laughs> in the late game. How about forcing the issue here? Because BBD actually has another copy of Gear Hulk in hand, and now he's going to be forced to run it out as uh, Ixalan's binding targeting the Gear Hulk could strand the other one in hand. What? Ooh, Brian let it resolve. What does that mean? I have no idea. Ah, oh, he's got commit. Oh. He's gonna put Ixalan's binding. Yeah, no, not not that one, Ari. <laughs> wow, so this Back is on top super and get punishing. another trigger from the Gear Hulk. Oh my god. Yeah, one of the big, big, big risks of using that uh, exile based removal like Ixalan's binding is oh. if your opponent can answer it. So you see Brian Rondoin getting both a, f uh, a surprise blocker to eat Ari's creature and an extra trigger off of the enters the battlefield ab ability. Huge swing. Oh, and now he gets to use the gear hulk to take Chandra out of the equation. This one's in the books. There is no way Ari's coming back from that. Remember, BBD has another gear hulk in hand. He can simply use it to commit this Jade Light Ranger and an attack for lethal. <laughs> and that's going to be game number two going to Brian Brown doing. Woo! That was a beating. Yeah. That commit was unreal. And now I have to sort of eat my words from a moment ago. I had been complaining about this blue-black mid-range deck mm -hmm. and um, part of that complaint is that I felt like it was a little one-dimensional, like it could really only win the games with uh, the Scarab God. Okay. But actually we see Brian bringing the match to a deciding third game and he hasn't even drawn the Scarab God once in either game. 
He, True. he used uh, mostly Glimmer of Genius and Torrential Gear Hulk, which in part is a, is a bit of a transform sideboard for him. Man, these are really swingy games too, aren't they? We saw Ari Lax hit that Glorybringer and just swing the needle in his direction in game number one. And that game was all about that last play. That just shut the door on this game so hard, there was no way. That, uh, that Ari could come back from that. Ari really did bride a favor there with uh, temporarily exiling his, his gear hole. No kidding. Torrential Gear Hulk, one that's been around for a while, not exactly anything new to the format. But um, it's, it's always a fair question whether players want to build it into their decks in a mid-range strategy like this because six mana is a bit pricey and you have to make sure you have uh, instants, and instants in the graveyard to fuel it. Which shuffle technique do you like better? Multi-pile or just two? Uh, you know, I have to say I like both. The most important thing for shuffling Come on. in my book Both? is is that you use more than one method every time you shuffle because no single way of shuffling is perfect. So as long as you, you mix and match, that's going to make me happy. All right. BBD going for the riffle. Plus, what do you call that? Pile sh no, that's not pile shuffling. What, what do you call that when you just jam them together like that? Side shuffle. Side shuffle? That's what I call it, yeah. Yeah, that's a good name for it. By the way, chat's really disappointed in you. For not giving a firm answer? Yeah, for saying both. You didn't come down hard on one side. You know, it, When you're in the booth, you're supposed to be like provocative and Okay. I actually, I, I, I do really like Ari's shuffling, and it's not one that I've seen many other players use, but what I really love about it is the cards never come off the table. No risk of either player seeing the bottom card. Look at that. That's, That's pretty a important. great point, Reed. Look mm -hmm. at the way he's shuffling. You'll see the players will look to the opposite side that the cards are facing when they shuffle to just to make sure that there's no impropriety there. But uh, with the way that Ari does it, never has to. Cards face down the whole time. All right, underway for game number three. Let's see if we got some keeps for our two uh, professional Magic players down in the feature match here, here in round number five. Land, land. What do you got, Ari? Ooh, that's a good start here. Servant of the Conduit. BBD's going to want to answer that ASAP if he can. Shows the big difference between being on the play and the draw because if he has like a Glint Sleeve Siphoner, he'd like to play that card, but you do not want to let your opponent untap with Servant of the Conduit. He could slam Chandra, rekindling. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that just not ends the game literally but puts you so far behind. Uh-oh. Chart a course here from Brian Brown doing. I imagine that's not number one on his list of cards to play on turn two. No, there's no card advantage. There's no adding to the board. It's more of just a smooth my draw type of situation, but there are worse things than that. Make sure that he hits his land drop. Does Ari have the same? Yes. Uh-oh. Bang. Rekindling Phoenix. Now, I assume he would have been a little happier with Chandra there. Probably. The one thing about the Phoenix is it can be answered one for one if Brian has Vraska's Contempt. Right. And Brian's going to actually just take the four, signaling he may not have it this time. He also may be... All right, sorry about that. Uh, let's see what happened. Let's reconstruct it. Supreme Will countered... Chandra. Chandra. Okay. And I think Brian does have Vraska's Contempt in hand, so that's an example of him using his life total as a resource, prioritizing keeping mana open and not letting the board spiral out of control because he doesn't want to get in this holding pattern of, I'm going to answer the threat you played last turn and you're going to play a new threat and get value out of it. He wants to sort of preempt that by making sure that Chandra's and Glorybringers never hit the battlefield. There's Vraska's Contempt eating that Phoenix. Oh, wow, Carney T. 
Carnage Tyrant hits the battlefield for Lax. This is going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah, we're seeing a wide variety of very potent six mana cards on both sides of the this matchup. Uh, Ari did not get to cast a Johnny yet, but Carnage Tyrant super potent Wait. against these blue black controllers. Oh, but there we go. Gifted Aetherborn, a very nice answer. That is Brian's answer, but Chandra or a Glorybringer. Oh, and there's Glorybringer. Oh, man. Tapped and attacking and exerted here from Ari Lax to take out the Death Touch blocker and put Brian Brown doing in a really tough position. Taking 11 damage, but more importantly, still facing down the Carnage Tyrant with no realistic answer other than perhaps another gifted Aetherborn with may just leave him dead anyway. Whew. This has been some heavy hitters going back and forth between these two decks. And so far, Ari Lax's Naya Monsters seem to be slightly heavier hitters on average. Okay, there's another Death Toucher with Gaunti, Lord of Luxury, but it still doesn't look great for BBD, does it? Oh, actually, he hit a nice one here in what did he hit? Thopter Arrest, although I think he's already made his land drop this turn, so he's going to have to really cross his fingers that the Gaunti can trade with the Carnage Tyrant. That would have Brian taking four more damage down to two. Then next turn, if he can use Thopter Arrest to take out the Glorybringer, at least he can beat what's on the board. But we know how punishing the top of Ari's library can be if, if Ari finds something else or has something in hand already. Wow, this is going to be very, very close. But, you know, the real problem here from BBD is even if that line works out, he has to... Oh, he had a land drop here, Reed. Oh, he did not have a land drop here. Yeah, you were right. Awkward. Oops. Well, it looks like he took it back. Yeah, I... I I, I re remembered, like, visually the board state last turn was Brian played two two-mana spells and had just Ether Hub untapped, so yeah. th that means he had five lands. And uh, You're right. This turn he, I think, maybe <laughs> peeled two lands off of his draw step and the Glint Sleeve Siphoner, which could have made it confusing. So what I was going to say, though, is, is that even if he's able to survive this board state, ooh, negate from Brian Brown doing, that would have been game. By that the way, game, that was yeah. a game-saving negate there from BBD. He still has just a chance, though. He needs Ari Lax to really have nothing going and not get anything going for the next few turns. What was that pump fake there from Ari? He acted like he was going to cast something. He has a cycling land in his hand, um, ah. and he, I think he decided uh, uh, there's nothing I'm going to draw into that I'm going to use, so I might as well not leave it open to like a duress or something like that if I do draw into something helpful. All I'll right. just wait till the other turn. Okay. Here's Thopter Arrest now for Brian Brown doing as his best option to kill the Glory Bringer. Yeah, that's the card that we believe Brian took off Gaunti Lord of Luxury. Oh, yeah. Naturally, not in his own deck, but part of the fun of Standard is so many cards like the Dire Fleet Daredevil, like the Gaunti, that allow you to play with your opponent's cards. BBD is actually going to cast a pre-combat chart, of course. Perhaps not attacking with the Siphoner this turn. We saw him attack last turn so that he could get one extra card because now he can go down to one life with the block. But he knows how important each and every card is at this juncture. No, well, he is going to attack. Maybe he just wanted the information ahead of time and figured, I've got cards I can pitch that don't matter anyway. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And there it is. Thopter Arrest. Says, ooh, and look at this, a gifted Aetherborn as well. So two potential blocks here for the Tyrant, meaning that even one removal spell won't get the job done, right? No, it, a glory bringer would, but a yes. normal removal spell would only have wow. Brian going on to he one. He found a normal removal spell here as well. Oh, but he can use it on anything, and he's going to use it on Thopter Arrest, which means glory bringer comes back. Wow, nice play from Ari. And that's game. Yes, that is game. 
because he's going to take four in the air and go to one. And Ari Lax finds the victory. Oh, baby. Ixalan's binding my own copy of Thopter Arrest that you cast against me last turn to unleash the dragon and get the job done. What a close, hard-fought match that ended up being. Yeah, really awesome, awesome deck from Ari there. Um, Ari had strong draws in all three games. It's not always that you see these monsters decks hit all their land drops right. and have multiple of those top end threats. Sometimes they do have to just settle for one. But uh, I really want to drive home the point that Ari's deck is built with all of these explorer creatures, Merfolk, Branch Walker, Jade Light Ranger, and sort of an unsung hero of that game right there were the cycling lands, which Ari, you saw, carefully held in his hand, didn't play them out after hitting a six land. And then at the crucial moment of the game, he cycled, got one extra draw step, found the Ixalan's binding, that was it. So having all these ways to mitigate mana screw and mana flood built into the deck is what really makes it quite strong. Yeah, and you know, you see those as they curve up the chain where they're playing these explorer creatures and hitting those land drops or sometimes just making threats, right? I mean, we are talking about potentially 3-2 on turn two, a 4-3 on turn three. Like, that's a lot of power just to put on the battlefield. It's kind of one of those cool one-two punches where your opponent probably has answers for those type of cards, but they kind of need to answer those type of cards too. And then when you start casting glory bringers, they're looking at their hand like, well, I can't answer every single thing you do. Yeah, that's an exchange you're just so happy with if you're the, the, the monsters deck, is if you play Jade Light Ranger, you get to manipulate the top of your library, potentially put a card or two into your hand. Then your opponent spends a removal spell they're spending their turn, they're spending a card, and that's one less answer that they're going to have when your real threats start hitting the battlefield. Yeah, and boy, the real threats are legit in this deck. My goodness sakes, those things looked ridiculous. You know what the, I mean, the true all-star of this match was Glorybringer, right? I know it's not the new card, but my God, did that thing do work. Yeah, just an excellent card and particularly punishing against the blue-black decks that uh, usually are tapping out for creatures that are going to die to the trigger and mm -hmm. I mean even if you answer it after the fact with a Vraska's Contempt that's the good case scenario where you still take four damage and lose one of your best cards. It's interesting too that we see this build from Ari go toe to toe with a blue black deck that really has a strong late game with Torrential Gear Hulk and the Scarab God and he was just like yeah we can just go toe to toe with that no problem. Normally I think I'd give the advantage to the blue black player there rather than the hey here's my green white and red creature you know yeah kill that kill that play a thing. All right, it sounds like we've got Ari Lax down in the feature match area right now. Ari, Marshall Cycliffe with Reed Duke. How's it going, buddy? Great. How's it going with you guys? Great. Nice win. Boy, that was a close match and a really yeah. fun one to watch. Tell us about your Naya Monsters deck. Uh, well, so this is a deck that uh, we've been working on for a while. Uh, if you actually look at the online results, you'll see one list of it, and that was me discovering that uh, <laughs> the Magic Online publication script runs sometime between 10.43 and 11 a.m. <laughs> Eastern time on Monday. <laughs> Uh, on my alternate account. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just uh, really powerful. Um, basically, the, the way the deck was generated was, uh, I, the, you know, in traditional fashion, I played a bunch of stuff, yelled about different things that I thought were good or bad in the format, and then someone else just said, oh, you said all these things are good. We're just going to put them in a deck. <laughs> and then I put all the good things in the deck, and then we just kept winning. So Yeah, yeah you know, it. it was really impressive how your deck went toe-to-toe -to -toe with a blue-black kind of mid-range value with a really strong late game. Yeah. You know, traditionally, I would think, well, they can answer your threats, and then they have these Scarab Gods and Torrential Gearhulks to just kind of take over, but that didn't really play out that way. No, a Gear Hulk is a little scary depending on what they're flashing back. I mean, Gear Hulk Glimmer is always scary for everyone who plays against that uh, pair of cards. Uh, Scarab God is one of the considerations that made us actually add white to the deck. Um, the red green monsters deck uh, had been around for a while, which is the same basic shell of I'm going to put, you know, Rekindling Phoenix, Chandra, and Glorybringer with green cards, and then the green cards are only there so that I can hit my land so that I can cast those cards. Uh -huh. um, but those decks have to rely on struggle to survive, which, while that is, like, a good thing against Gear Hulk to be able to shuffle away graveyards, uh, you end up in this spot against the Scarab God where you have, like, how many struggle to survive can you really play? Right. You have to hit all your lands on time. You know, it just doesn't pan out exactly the way you want it to. Yeah, uh, Reed, you know, I know you were really impressed with the, the Jade Light Rangers and the Merfolk Branch washer, Walkers out of the deck. Yeah, Ari, you you've seem to have really prioritized Explore for your early plays in this deck. Um, how important is that to just making sure you can get the mana for your, your big heavy hitters? It's somewhat important. We tested various other red-white decks, like the, the Ben Stark uh, Mono Red Treasure deck. We tested a version of that with uh, the white removal as well. And it's the same shell of, like, Phoenixes and stuff. And it performed okay. Um, 
I think that it's... If you wanted to play that and not have Jade Light Ranger in your deck, it's not actually that big of a deal. Um, but they're just like... It gives you a flexibility in how you're approaching the game. Uh, so, like, you can be proactive against decks where you need to be proactive. Uh, they're not the best blockers, but they block when you need to block. And then they kind of do their, the other thing of filtering your draws. So, uh, I don't... You put them in your deck because they're good enough, but they're not the best cards in your deck. We, we saw the uh, Ixalan's Bindings and also a Thopter Arrest played a key role there. How important was uh, that type of removal, the Exile-style yeah. removal for you guys? Extremely important. Uh, it really... It really changed how the deck can operate. You can go, uh, no longer does your glory bringer just like run into a scarab god that it can't beat. Like you just get to go toe to toe in a long game, and every single exchange you make with glory bringer, you end up ahead. Uh, most of the exchanges you make with Chandra, you end up ahead. Same with uh, rekindling phoenix. You know you have ten to twelve of these awesome cards in a given game. There's only so many answers they can have. Um, two more questions for you, Ari. First one: What's the what's the best card? in your deck that, you know, maybe is a little underrated to people that's under the radar? Under the radar? You know, like, uh, is, it, is it just like, hey, Glorybringer is the best card in the deck and that's it? Well, or is there yeah. something that's uh, <laughs> performing, uh, you know, a little better than maybe you it's, thought it would? I, honestly, if you look at the deck, it's just literally all, like, absurdly good cards. <laughs> yeah, so it's hard it really to point is. out, like, one card that's that's good. It's like, hey, Jund player, what's your best Jund card? And they're like... <laughs> it's Bloodbraid Elf. Yeah, right, or Thoughtseize. Like, it's all good. <laughs> Well, hey, we were disappointed not to get to see a Johnny unyielding. You left it on top of your library oh, yeah. in the first game, but then it shuffled it away. Yeah. Last round, I got to discard the hand size because a Johnny drew me too many cards. Uh. Good, good problem to have. <laughs> not yeah. bad. Not, not, not yeah. bad in your Naya deck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Last question for you. What do you have written down on that sheet that you consult? We're, we're assuming that it's not sideboard notes, but that it's Actually, actually inspirational quotes. Yeah. Oh, this? Yeah. Oh, no. It's it's sideboard notes and uh. then online metagame percentages of cards and decks, which is actually, like, really oh. nice. This is, um, so Bobby Fortinelli uh, worked with us for this GP, and uh, he brings this to every tournament. So he has, like, percentages of, like, oh, half of the people playing team or mid-range are going to bring a Carnage Tyrant or something like that. Wow. Oh, that's really in-depth. Wow, that's, yeah. That, yeah. All yeah, right. Well, great stuff, Ari. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us, and yeah. good luck the rest of the day with your Naya Monsters deck. Thanks. Have fun in the we'll booth. We'll see ya. Oh, I really thought it was inspirational quotes, you know? I thought he's like, ah, I, got the, I got the plan down in my head. <laughs> <It's just gonna laughs> Maybe song lyrics? No? All right. Well, it sounds like we've got a little bit of a break ahead of us. When we come back, though, we're going to have our time walk match here for round number five. Don't go anywhere.